right, so this is the third time I've done this video only because I was getting super long winded. When I talk about water cooling, I get very passionate about it. And I start to talk about it like Barnacles talks about 3D printing where it's like blah, 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 blah. That's actually not my impression of Jerry. That's my impression of me. So don't, don't get all mad at me saying I'm making fun of Jerry. It's not true. It's not true at all. Today's video is brought to you by lynda.com slash j, the online learning platform where you can learn about pretty much any subject you want at your own rate. Maybe you wanna be a gaming programmer and you wanna learn from some of the leading experts in the world about how to design games. Well, that's what lynda.com slash j is offering. You can go up there and check out online courses and thousands of videos about how to do practically anything. Some of the courses I recommend just based on my own interests would be automotive repair, photography, videography, editing, and you guys can pretty much brush up on any topic you want. And the coolest thing is you can do it completely at your own pace. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to lynda.com slash J for your free 10 day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash J-A-Y. Make sure you use that link. That way they know that I'm the one that sent you. Okay, the goal of today's video is not to pick the parts for you, it's to arm you with the knowledge you need to pick the parts yourself. Give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish, well, you know the rest of the story, and if you don't, well, then you better start learning how to fish right now. So you want to do a water cooling loop, and you've spent time looking around the forums and on the websites, and at the end of the day, you're just pulling your hair out, and you're completely discombobulated, because you're like, this is hard. I finally built my computer, and this is hard. I can't there's more parts and I know what to do with and it doesn't make sense. Trust me, that's how I was when I was learning how to do all of this. And it's easy once you learn what stuff means. So that's the point of today's video. And we're gonna start with chapter one. Now we're gonna start right with the basics because sometimes people wanna move right into the advanced stuff before they even understand the simple stuff. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. Now at the very least, here's a list of parts you're going to need to connect all of your parts in your custom loop. You need a block, a pump, a radiator, optionally a reservoir. You need tubing, fans, coolant, and fittings. That's what you need. That doesn't get any more basic than that. We're done. All right, guys, thanks for watching today's video. And okay, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. We'll go ahead and talk about each one of those and give you kind of a high level description of what those parts mean. And hopefully then when you start looking through your spec sheets and stuff, when you're shopping on websites, you can understand what it is you're looking at. They connect to a part, grab the heat, and send it off into La La Land through the cooling loop to be exhausted into the atmosphere and heat up your room and then go into your lungs and out your ass when you fart or whatever else. So that's kind of like the circle of life when it comes to cooling your PC. At the end of the day, you fart the heat. I've got a full metal block over here by Alpha Cool with a brass top and a copper base. And then I've got over here a nickel plated copper base block from EK Water Blocks. This is a supremacy block with a plexi see-through top. Now, one thing I want to get really clear really quickly, it doesn't matter if it's copper, it doesn't matter if it's nickel. They're going to cool virtually identically the same. Even finding a difference of one degree Celsius between nickel plated and bare copper is usually accounted for in margin of error. So nickel plating is more of an aesthetics thing, but it doesn't matter if it's a plastic top or a metal top. The top makes no difference to the cooling of the block. It all happens on the base, which is where the fins are, and that is where the cooling is gonna take place. So just pick the one you think looks cool and has good reviews. Radiators. This is always a fun one. This tends to get people really all up in arms because they don't know what it means. All right, there's three major stats you need to know when it comes to radiator. Stat number one, you've got the length measured in fans. So you would have a 120 or a 240 or a 360 or a 480, etc., etc. So that's just usually uh, telling you how many fans of what size you could fit on there. So obviously a 120 radiator is a 120 millimeter fan. A 240 two of them, 360, three of them, et cetera, et cetera. If they're a 140 millimeter fan, then there would be a 140, a 280, a 420, et cetera, et cetera. The other stat you need to know is about the radiator thickness. The smallest you'll pretty much find is a 30 millimeter, which I'm holding right here. Then they tend to go up in 15 millimeter increments where they're gonna go from 30 to 45 to 60, and then they tend to jump to 80 millimeters, which is the monster rad found uh, pretty much, I think the only company offering monster rads is Alpha Cool. It's like an 80 millimeter thick, thick beast, it's crazy. And then the third one is the one that tends to really catch people off guard. And this is what they don't know what to choose. And that is FPI, which stands for fins per inch. 
That's the number of fins that is going to be present in one inch of fins. That's also referred to as fin density. So FPI or fin density is referring to the same thing. So I've got two radiators right here. Both are the same thickness, 30 mils. Both are 120 millimeter radiators, but they both are very different in that this one here from Alpha Cool is a low fin density radiator at about 10 FPI, whereas this one over here from Hardware Labs has about twice the fin density in it. Plus it has a, a split fin design. Now these two radiators are also gonna have different requirements when it comes to the fan for them. A lower FPI radiator can get away with a lower static pressure fan running at lower RPMs while sacrificing a little bit of the cooling efficiency and maximum TDP wattage or you know, wattage that could be dissipated in this radiator. This guy over here will typically act like a thicker radiator by adding more fins in the same area but at the sacrifice of acoustics, where you'll have to typically run a higher RPM static pressure fan in order to push the air through this many fins. Having this many fins also means a little bit more turbulence, a little bit more resistance, and that of course is what you're actually hearing as the air goes through the radiator. Not the fan, you're hearing the air being pushed by the fan, bouncing off all of these fins. So you can get more cooling out of a smaller radiator at the sacrifice of acoustics. Now in terms of what size radiator I recommend, well I recommend a 120 for every part that you're cooling. So if you're cooling a CPU and a GPU, a 240 would be the minimum. And I recommend that for stock speeds. The moment you start overclocking, you are gonna oversaturate that radiator's maximum TDP that it can dissipate, and you are gonna start getting heat soak where the parts get hotter and hotter over time. So I recommend if you're gonna overclock, a 240 for every part that you've got in the system. So if you're gonna overclock your CPU and you're gonna overclock your GPU, then you're gonna need a 240 for each one for a total of 480 millimeters. It doesn't have to be a 480 mil rad, but it does need to be a total of 480 millimeters. That's the formula I use at a bare minimum. I would go with as much radiator space as you can fit or surface area that you can fit in your case. I'd rather have more cooling than necessary than not enough, trust me. GPU blocks, we've got a 980 Ti sitting right here with a full cover block on it. Now people always ask me, what does full cover mean? Full cover doesn't mean it goes to the end of the card. That's not what full cover means. Full coverage means the block is contacting all of the parts on the card that generate heat. That namely being the GPU core, the VRM or power delivery system, and the RAM chips. And then a backplate is mostly aesthetics and also offers some rigidity, but at the sacrifice of more weight. A full cover card is going to be a lot heavier than say just a universal core block that you could put on the GPU, but this thing here will give you maximum overclocking and it'll give you maximum cooling and it's going to also add a lot of heat into your loop. So that's why you need to make sure you have more radiator than you need, than, or at least that you think you need, that way you have plenty. Now some of the blocks will go to the end of the card, some like this one won't. It's really gonna be up to the manufacturer and how they make them look. Uh, with EK, all of the plexi blocks are shorter and all of the acetal blocks like I have on my Titans behind me are the length of the card. Why they did it that way, I have no idea, but this is gonna be a little bit lighter than the blocks that you would find right now uh, in Skunk Works. So that's something to keep in mind too. This is like twice the weight of what the graphics card used to be. Maybe not twice, but pretty damn close. Okay, so fittings. Here's one that people tend to really overcomplicate. Fittings for soft tubing, all you've got to do is match the numbers. So if you are using a 3 8 by 5 8 soft tube, then you want compression fittings that are 3 8 by 5 8 Guess what? They match. The barb is going to go onto the tube, the collar is going to slide over, you're going to tighten it down, and you're going to have a good day because typically it won't leak. You're going to have a bad day if you don't match those or you get a collar that's too big and it doesn't actually clamp down. But as long as the numbers match, now Euro sizing, some Euro websites, they deal with the millimeters. Here in the United States, we still deal with the standard system where you've got, you know, three eighths, five eighths, half inch, three quarter inch, all that sort of stuff. So if you're on a European site, don't worry. Typically, they'll, they'll convert it back to the way everyone else in the world does it. So it's just the US guys that have to worry about that. When it comes to barbs, all you've got to do is match the barb size to the inner diameter measurement of the tube. So if you've got a half inch inner diameter tube, then you want a half inch barb. That's it, there you go. Now the other thing people get really confused about is the threading of the actual fitting itself. I've had people email me asking why people run half inch inner diameter fittings when the hole is only a quarter inch big. 
That's because they see G quarter thread and they think that means that the hole is only a quarter inch big. G quarter thread is the thread size, not the hole size. The hole is much bigger than the inner diameter of the fitting and the tubing. I promise you that. G one quarter thread is also the only thread I've ever used. I've never used G three eighths. I've uh, never needed to use it. In fact, I got sent it one time and it was, it was like the black sheep. It just got banished to the closet and it, it didn't even have a purpose. Nobody uses that. It's just G one quarter thread all day long. Now fittings for rigid tubing, uh, it's all pretty much measured in millimeters and they tend to always be a 10 millimeter inner diameter, but, but that doesn't matter. Nothing else matters with rigid tubing except the outer diameter of the tube. And you'll typically find 10 by 12, 10 by 13 and 10 by 16. Those are like the two sizes that you will typically, or three sizes you'll typically find. Bits Power seems to kind of have, have all the 12 millimeter stuff going on with the uh, Crystal Link. 13 millimeters, the most common that you're gonna find, and then 16 millimeters making, it, making its way into the scene with being a thicker tube that people are liking to see, nice big fat tubes. But all fittings for rigid tubing are compression. That's the only way it can hold together. You, tighten the collar down, the O-ring expands or gets squished out and it pushes against the actual tube and it's not gonna pull out or go anywhere. So if you're gonna be using a 13 millimeter outer diameter rigid tube, then you want a 13 millimeter compression fitting for rigid tubing. It's really simple. It's not any more difficult than that. So don't overcomplicate it. All right, fellas, let's go ahead and talk about our tube. All right, I'm gonna keep it clean. I'm gonna keep it, I want at least one video that's clean. Just one. There could be so many innuendos in this video. I mean, it's just so hard. Do you see what I mean? This sucks. There's another one. The jokes just keep pulling them right out of my ass. We were kind of on a roll there for a moment, weren't we? So when it comes to tubing, you've got a few different types of tubing. You have got soft tubing and hard tubing. And ladies, you know which one you prefer. Okay, I promise, I promise I'll stop. I'll stop, I'll stop it now. Soft tubing is very flexible. It tends to be clear usually, but now you have black and you have white and you are starting to get uh, different colors of soft tubing that are being introduced onto the market. But soft tubing materials tend to vary depending on the actual appearance of the tube. So white and black and all of that are gonna be usually a different type of material. But one thing to keep in mind is clear soft tubing will tend to over time cloud and leach plasticizer, which depending on the quality of the tube that you use, if enough plasticizer gets leached, it could get stuck in the tiny microfins found inside GPU blocks and CPU blocks and could cause you a, you know, a bad day. So you would definitely wanna stay away from the plumbing section at Home Depot using the soft PVC or soft vinyl tubing because that stuff, I've never seen any tubing leach like vinyl. Trust me, it is terrible. So Tygon tends to be the, the material that a lot of people go towards. Now rigid tubing, you're gonna have three major materials. Usually you're gonna have a PETG, which is much more uh, impact resistant, easier to bend, bends at a lower temperature, doesn't bubble up as much, but it's a little bit more cloudy. It's also harder to cut. It's also harder to deburr because it tends to chatter and be a lot softer as it's a much more plasticky material. Uh, but then you have acrylic which is much clearer than PETG most of the time, uh, but it's also much more brittle. It's harder to bend because it tends to be very sensitive to the heat where you can go from not hot enough to too hot and blistering in just a couple of seconds depending on your heat application. So it's a lot more finicky when it comes to bending. The other thing which people are starting to do now, which actually people were doing first and then it went away and then it came back, is people using like copper tubing where they're going down to Home Depot and they're getting copper tube and tube benders and tube straighteners and they're doing some really cool like steampunk stuff or polished copper or even nickel plating the copper and getting metal pipes in their system as well. Um, that's one thing to keep in mind that you could do, but it's a lot more work. It's a whole different style of bending. We're not even gonna really talk about it in this video other than it's a type of material people have used in rigid feeding, uh, tubing builds. But the reason why I'm mentioning it though is because copper tubing tends to have the same outer diameters as its PETG and acrylic counterparts. So the fittings for those uh, rigid tubes are compatible with copper tubes if they're the same diameter. It makes no difference. All right, we're getting ready to drop the bombshell of all bombshells, and that is the fact that when it comes to coolants, Jay's Two Cents is saying it right here today, I do not recommend running straight distilled water in your system, period. I think people are gonna dis disagree with me on that. I don't recommend it, and I don't recommend running straight deionized water as well. Those are meant to be bases for concentrated fluids 
that are have things in them that you need in your system. Straight distilled water has no growth inhibitors. Sure, the minerals and stuff have typically been steamed out, but over time, growth can still occur. Not as often, obviously, as like tap water or drinking water, but growth could occur. The other thing is when the water is stripped of its ion during the distilling process or the deionized process, the water wants its ions back. As bad as I want my GPUs back when someone takes one or borrows one, as, as much as Jay is a whore for GPUs, water is a whore for ions. And it's going to try and pull it from anywhere that it can, which means it could start attacking the metal surfaces in your loop. It'll attack aluminum the most. Fortunately, most companies don't use aluminum for any of their metals for their radiators or their blocks and stuff, so it won't really be a problem. But it could start corroding either the copper or the nickel plating or whatever. And if your nickel plating isn't the greatest uh, you know, quality, then the deionized or distilled water could start attacking that first, causing corrosion and flaking. But if you're gonna ignore me and you're gonna use it anyway because you can get it for a buck down at the grocery store, uh, at least here in the United States, some countries have to actually ship in their distilled water. That's kind of crazy. But you at the very least would need to add uh, two or three drops of PT Nuke, which is a biocide, to keep growth from happening inside of your straight watered loop. Now, if you're gonna take my advice and use distilled or deionized water with a concentrate, just know that all the concentrates on the market, all they are is designed to be poured into like a, a, a usually three parts water to one part concentrate. Uh, to give you the fluid that has everything you need in it. It's got anti-corrosives, anti-growth inhibitors. Uh, it's it's gonna have everything in there, you, even, even uh, lubricants to keep your pumps nice and, and lubricated so that you're going to keep everything nice and healthy in your system. And they tend to be good for uh, sometimes up to two years, depending on, on the type of metals in your system uh, before you have to change the fluid. Whereas distilled water would need to be changed usually every six months if you're running just straight distilled. Now nanofluids are what I'm using in Skunk Works. Nanofluids actually give you a little bit better cooling because the nanoparticles themselves are giving you another catalyst of transferring heat away. So the nanoparticles will soak up the heat as well, move it, and then off it goes. Plus you get a really nice kind of a neat opaque color where it's not see-through or transparent. The only problem with nanofluids is uh, when you turn off the system and it sits for any length of time, the color starts to fall out a little bit where it starts to look very thin. And then when you start up the system, it remixes and everything's fine again. But don't worry, that fallout is not gonna clog up. The nanoparticles are so small, they'll just remix once the pump starts moving the fluid and you get kind of a neat swirling effect. One thing to keep in mind though, if you're going to PETG or acrylic tubing is that there have been negative effects uh, between ethylene glycol mixed solutions with those types of tubing. So you could have a problem there. So you wanna make sure that the coolant that you're picking is not based on uh, ethylene glycol, which could be a problem, especially with those plastics. Now, I'm not sure what else there is to talk about. I know this video wasn't super fancy, but I wanted to share the information with you guys. I also know it was kind of long and it could have been much longer. Trust me, some of the other recordings I did were upwards of 40 minutes. But anyway, if you guys have any questions, do me a favor, hit me up on Twitter. And if you think I left something out that should have been in this, maybe we'll turn this into a series where I'll, I will do an update and go more into depth of particular topics within the chapters that we've discussed today. So hit me up on Twitter, I'm at Jay's Two Cents. Uh, tell me what you think I may have left out or if you guys just enjoyed the video, you can tell me that too. That always helps and makes my day a little bit better. Uh, but I hope this video has helped you guys and I hope you understand a little bit better about these parts and what they mean. So I'm gonna get on out of here guys. Thanks for watching, share this video if you think it's helped. Favorite this video if you enjoyed it or just hit the like button if you guys liked it. Otherwise, mash the hell out of the dislike button because even though it makes me sad, um, that helps too. So, all right guys, time to get out of here and we'll see you in the next one.